Hi everyone. So, when I normally introduce one of my videos, I try and set the scene, build up a little bit of tension and give you an insight into what you're going to listen to. Tonight I want to do something a little bit different and I just want to say be happy and stay safe. There are a lot of bad people out there in the world, but events like those you're going to listen to in tonight's video are, thankfully, few and far between. So, stay safe, and sit back, relax with your favorite drink, because it's time to listen. Apartment Experience a couple of years ago, I was living in a small two-bedroom apartment, just my small chihuahua and myself. For perspective, I was a 22-year-old, and the apartment I lived in was more like a large house that was separated into three sections, each with three different apartments. I only had one other neighbor living in these units, and he lived to my left. All the other units were vacant. I'd never felt unsafe living there until this incident. I'd leave for work during the week at around 7.30 a.m. and wouldn't return home until after 5 p.m. I had a definite daily routine. While I was at work, I would leave my dog in the living room area so she could lounge on the couch. In this area, there were large sliding glass doors that led you to the backyard. When I would take Honey, my dog, out, there was a large red fence that wrapped around my yard and separated it from my neighbor's yards on my left, right, and behind. Besides my one fellow renter, there were a few houses that were occupied behind me. All of the people who lived around me seemed normal and never made a lot of noise or caused any issues. So, one day, I went to work as usual. After work I decided to go visit my friend for a little while. When I was there, I had this feeling that I should wait before going home. So I stayed a little longer than I had originally planned. When I got home it was around 9pm. I opened my door and called to Honey, as I normally do. She would always run up to me and jump around in excitement. This time, however, I noticed she was in her cage that I kept open, and it contained her food and water bowls. I kept calling her name, but she never responded. I started feeling a sense of dread. I walked up to her cage, and I immediately realized she was dead. At first, I thought she had died of some sort of natural cause. I then looked up and realized the door to the second bedroom was wide open. I always keep it closed, and I knew I hadn't opened it before work. It was at that moment I knew someone had been in my house. My blood ran cold and I ran outside and stood there in shock for a minute. Wanting to hear a familiar voice, I called my dad, who was, luckily, in town right then, and advised me to call the cops. The cop arrived at the apartment and immediately began saying that the dog probably died of natural causes. However, I showed her where the back gate was wide open, and several other clues someone else had been there. She still didn't believe me, and wouldn't do anything else until we did an autopsy on Honey to show she had been killed. Fast forward a week later, and we get the autopsy results back. She had died of blunt force trauma to the head, and whoever did it to her had placed her in the cage and covered her up to make her look like she'd been sleeping. Our best guess is that the person killed her because she wouldn't stop barking. 
When a detective was sent to the apartment, he asked around to all of my neighbours, and no one had seen or heard anything. Also, the guy who lives beside me didn't have anyone break into his apartment, so I feel like whoever did this was looking for me. It's been two years since this incident, and the culprit was never caught. experience with a cult. My friend, who we'll call Mary for anonymity's sake, used to belong to a church that was a branch off their main one in the Philippines, where she was born and where much of her family still lives. Mary's church was incredibly strict, claiming you'd be damned to hell if you so much as swore. They'd also have to attend church not once, but three days of the week. I had been at her church with her a few times, and I was wary from the start. For example, once the pastor learned I was a lesbian, he decided to make the whole sermon about me and how gays were doomed to hell. It really pissed me off and I didn't go with her again. So. A few months later, there's word that some of the higher up in the main church are stealing money. Word travelled to Mary's branch, and her and her family started to speak up, mainly her mother. Her mum would post on Facebook to warn other members about what was happening, and maybe help stop it. That was mistake number one. Some church people, I really don't know what they're called sent messages to Mary's mum, telling her to stop what she was doing. Being the badass that she is, she promptly told them to shove it. Mistake number two. So, two priests actually show up at their door, unannounced the next day, and they demand they speak with the mother, and that Mary and her siblings go to their rooms. Scared, they obeyed, leaving their mother alone with these men. Now, nobody but her mum knows what happened, but what I can say is that they came out of their rooms to see her curled up on the floor, sobbing. Let me stop to emphasize for a moment that this lady is probably the toughest woman I've ever met. So for her to be like this, really scared everyone. At this time, reports started popping up of people going missing over in the Philippines. And with further research, they found that it was the people that spoke up against the church. I am dead serious here. Everyone's getting really scared. And Mary is confiding everything in me in the hope that I could help which I tried, but couldn't do much. One night she's sitting in her living room while her siblings are asleep, and, lo and behold, the same two men show up again, and start banging on their door like they're trying to break it down. Mary jumps behind the couch and frantically starts texting me while this is going on. It's midnight, and these psychos are trying to break her door in, I'm urging her to call the cops or her parents, who are out, and she's telling me that she's too scared. This goes on for 30 freaking minutes before they give up and leave. The moment they do, she rushes to her siblings' rooms, and they ran out, saying they heard everything. The final straw came when her aunt travelled back home to visit some friends and the church actually tried to find her. At this point, the disappearances in the Philippines had grown in number, and police weren't finding anything, probably because they were tipped off, as Mary said. We don't have much more information on this particular incident, aside from the fact that, after her mum posted about it on Facebook, 
they were excommunicated. This is still ongoing, though a lot more subdued. Well, for them at least. The reason she can't post this story, or that I can't give her a name, is because they're still tracking people down. If you know of anything that can help her, please let me know. I want my friend to be able to feel safe again. Sleeping on a friend's couch when a stranger walked through the door. This happened to me just about two hours ago, around 4.30 a.m. Around 4.30 a.m. and I can't get back to sleep. Every creak or drip of the faucet now makes me jump. I only stopped trembling about 15 to 20 minutes ago. So, I was asleep on my friend's couch and woke up to the sight of someone opening their front door. They may have said something to me through the cracked open door first, and either that or the door opening is what woke me up. This tall and very slender lady in a long, red, salmon-colored dress and something on her head started moving towards me. I tried to pretend to still be asleep, but once she knelt down next to me, I knew the jig was up. I fully opened my eyes and looked over at her to make out her face. She put her hand on my shoulder and started asking me questions that I didn't understand. The sentences just seemed jumbled and incoherent, despite the fact that she was speaking English, the only language I know. She was holding a couple of papers almost seemed like she was asking me questions off of it. I sat up and asked why she just walked inside, and she said she was from some department or something, and asked for my name. I didn't respond and just kind of looked around. I debated calling out for my friends or running for one of their rooms, but I feared for my physical safety. I grabbed my phone to call one of them after the most awkward 30 seconds of silence. And she just told me, I can see you're not ready yet. It's okay. And touched my arm and calmly walked out. I saw her walk towards the street from the window. I immediately made sure the doors were all locked as these friends usually don't lock up, which I'm sure is how she was able to just walk in. In total shock, I tried to wake up my friends via phone and just sat on the couch and waited for my heart to stop racing, or at least slow down. After 15 minutes, I went upstairs and woke them up. The friend that I know better, Max, thought it was weird but was mostly unconcerned. He apologized that this happened to me and went back to bed. The other friend, Brock, empathized and was also really freaked out. We sat in the stairwell for a bit before he went back to bed. I'm now back on the couch, but I don't know how to sleep anymore. I've never been more frightened and unnerved. Three men in a van. So, this happened about eight or nine years ago, when I was around ten years old. My family and I moved to the murder capital of Canada at the time. <laughs> Always a smart choice. I was just an average looking young kid attending the elementary school that happened to be attached to my backyard via a field. Since I lived in the same area, I often went exploring the streets, goofing around. Although it's known as the murder capital, I never really felt unsafe in my neighborhood. 
until this happened. So, during my lunch hour at school, my friends and I usually stayed at school or went to my friend's house to play The Sims. <laughs> Clearly we were cool. On this day, during lunch hour, I was walking back to school with two of my male friends. On that particular day, we decided to walk to the strip mall in the neighborhood over to go to McDonald's. It was only a 15 minute walk away and half of it was on a very public road, so I wasn't too scared to walk there. On our way back, we were only maybe two blocks away from the school when I noticed a really old, worn out looking brown van driving in our direction. This van looked like it drove straight out of the 70s, but I didn't think anything of it. As the brown van got closer, I expected it to just drive by like any other car, but I kept my eye on it because, even as a kid, strange old vans are incredibly creepy. The van is about to pass us, and I start to feel more comfortable. But instead of driving past, the second the brown van reached us, the driver slammed on the brakes, and it came to an instant stop. The streets were usually dead at that time of the day, and I only looked at the van for a split second, but I was fairly certain I could see that there were three guys inside. Major red flag alert. I instantly realize I need to get out of there. So me being the only smart one within our trio, obviously I doubled my pace so I could get away from the van. My two male friends, for some reason which I will never understand, didn't find it creepy and stay behind at the speed that they were walking. That's when the driver backs up to exactly where I was, which was about two feet ahead of the others at this point. I refused to look at the van that time. My nerves wouldn't let me. My fight or flight moment had long gone and I chose flight. I'm hoping that somehow, some way, the fact that they back up wasn't because I'd walked ahead. But then I hear the driver yell to me. How, How much, much for one, one night? night? I didn't exactly understand what it meant at the time, but it didn't sound good. As soon as he says this, I can hear a noise coming from the van. So I force myself to look over and I clearly see that someone is trying to open the sliding door of the van from the inside. Within half a second of hearing the click of the door starting to open, I began sprinting to my friend's house, which, thankfully, was in sight from where we were. And thankfully, my two male friends smartened up and started running too. I never once looked back, but after a few seconds I could hear the tires of the van speeding away. Once we got to my friend's house, after running inside, one of my friends told me, as the door started opening, one of the men seemed to be fiddling with something that looked like a gun. I tried to calm myself down by telling myself it was just some sick prank. It was probably just a BB gun or something along those lines. I didn't want to worry anyone by something that could easily have been a sick joke. So I didn't tell anyone when we got back to school. Fast forward to later that afternoon. Sitting in the computer lab, a classmate of mine comes in saying that some guys tried to abduct her during lunch hour in a brown van, but she'd run off before they could. She'd been walking from the direction I saw the van speed off in. <laughs> there was no way it wasn't the same van. I freaked out and told her what happened to me during the same lunch hour. Next thing I know, I'm being dragged into the office by the principal, where there are policemen and women waiting for me. I spend the rest of the school day being questioned by police about the incident, because they were opening a case on the matter. I never did find out what happened with the case, or if the same thing happened to any other young girls. It's definitely possible that it could have been a sick joke that these guys just took too far. But either way, I'd never been so scared in my life.
the chain swung. I come from a family of people who enjoy walking, hiking, taking the dog out, after dinner walks and so on. One way this manifested itself was me asking to be allowed to walk home from school while growing up. The way home was a little long for an elementary schooler with a loaded backpack, over a mile and a half with steep hills for the last third of a mile. But when I was 11, my parents gave me permission to walk it in fair weather. The route took me across the street from elementary school, down a sidewalk parallel to the busy road. A half mile later, I reached the middle school, walked past the track loop and the old oak with the bench underneath. After that point, it became residential, with the sidewalk slowly sloping downwards. After a few blocks, there was a stretch of privacy fence followed by a little park, ending in me turning left up the steep hill with my house at the very top in a cul-de-sac. Everything went smoothly that year and most of the next year as well. Then, one day, as I was walking past the track loop, I saw something odd. There was someone sitting on the bench beneath the old oak tree. This was strange because the elementary school let out 45 minutes before the middle school. Until the final bell rang, the fields were empty, except for the occasional P.E. class. He was a little too old for a middle school student. Not parent old, but more like a high schooler, or in his early twenties. I absent-mindedly thought this as I walked past him. A few feet later, I hear a soft, clinking noise. The bench guy had stood up. He was wearing a metal wallet chain, something that was really popular with the older boys at the time. With every step he took, it would sway, making muted metallic sounds. After the sounds continued for some time, I glanced behind me. He was about eight feet back, walking at a leisurely pace. So I continued past the houses, still hearing the clinking noise. I'm nearing the privacy fence, starting to feel scared. Is he following me? I take a quick glance behind me. There he is eight feet back. I walk faster, panicked. He is following me. I try to think what I should do. There's no one at the little park. My parents would be at work for two more hours, and I don't know if any of the neighbors were home. I reach my street and turn. He's still behind me. I jog, Backpack thump thumping, breathing loud, drowning out the sound of the chain, to the top of the hill and the cul-de-sac. I don't look back. Normally, I would enter through the garage, but I was not going to give him the chance to get into the house. I went around, past the side garden and through the back gate. I used my key and darted inside. At this point, I just wanted to hug the family dog and hide, but I had to know if he was still out there. The kitchen window overlooked the side garden. He was there, looking at the back gate. I ducked below the sink. There was no disputing it. This man had followed me for almost a mile straight to my house. I was shaking. I crawled to the living room phone, afraid of being seen, and called my mum. The police came, and shortly after, my mum. But by then, the chain man had already left. Stay off the streets late at night. We were 16, an age where you feel invincible. It was summer and school was out, 
and my friend and I, who lived in the same apartment complex as me, decided to go to the mall and kill time, as any other underage teenager would do. I don't remember much about that day, other than our walk home from the mall. It must have been around nine when we left, since that's the time the mall closes. Our apartment building was two miles away from the mall, so of course we walked. It was hot out, and we both knew once we got home, there would be nothing to do. So, we opted for the walk. We enjoyed the conversation and the passing of time. Our town wasn't exactly dangerous. Yes, there were muggings and theft, but it wasn't as bad as other cities in our county where rape and unsolved murders were commonplace. So, we walked those two miles, oblivious to any potential threats. We were a mile in when we passed an intersection. Shortly thereafter, three males walked out of the opposite street and began walking behind us. I didn't think much of it. <laughs> it's summer. They were young. It's hot. No reason to be suspicious. My friend, however, was unnerved. Hey. Yeah? <laughs> Those guys behind us. What about them? I'm pretty sure they're following us. <laughs> what? No. I just think you've been paranoid. As soon as I'd said that, one of the men started whistling at us. I turned around. What you got in the bag? We had shopping bags from the mall. Nothing. Leave us the fuck alone, my friend retorted. I remember being pissed. Why would she respond to them? At this point, I'm nervous as fuck. Turns out, my friend was right. Call it intuition. We begin walking faster now that we sense danger. And as we quicken our pace, so do the men. They know we're onto them. We near a plaza with a Del Taco, and as we enter the parking lot, the men disperse. One is directly behind us, and the other two are on our sides. I turn around. They all whip out fucking metal baseball bats out of nowhere. At this point, I turn to my friend and we hightail it to the Del Taco, not bothering to turn around. Thank God it wasn't too late, or they'd be closed and we'd have nowhere to hide. As soon as we enter the Del Taco, we look out the windows and witness all the men jump into a Cadillac Escalade that was parked. Were they only scaring us? Why the bats? Why the car? What the fuck is going on? We watch as the car drives away. That doesn't quell our fear. We spend about 10 minutes in the restaurant deciding what to do next. Do I call my dad to pick us up? Or do we walk the half mile home? <laughs> we didn't want our parents to worry. So, <laughs> for some incomprehensible reason, <laughs> we decide to walk. The whole time, we're constantly turning back, anticipating a black Escalade to pop out of nowhere and kidnap us. But it never did. As soon as we get home, we promise ourselves not to tell our parents, as it would hinder us from hanging out again. <laughs> the moment I walked through the door, I blabbed to my parents. <laughs> I later found out my friend did exactly the same. <sighs> Scariest experience of my young life. <laughs>